I remember uh, years ago at the, the TED conference telling the story of the little girl who uh, hardly ever paid attention in class and in this particular class she did. The teacher was running a drawing lesson and said the little girl was over in the corner and she normally didn't pay attention but she was completely absorbed and the teacher went over to her and said what are you drawing? And the girl said I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said but nobody knows what God looks like. And the girl said they will in a minute of pushing our kids to tell them that they could be innovators and that they should follow their passions to make something new is really where we need to be. My biggest fear is that my kids will sit in their schools. I have a first grader who's actually just graduated, so he's a second grader now. A second grader who's going to sit in school, and my biggest fear is that he'll sit up looking at the class, uh, the walls, and say, oh, only 11 more years. So I want everyone out there to close your eyes for a second and think about that really important multiple choice test that you took your favorite one. Exactly. We don't have fond memories of those multiple choice tests. However, if I were to ask you to close your eyes and think about that really great project that you did in your school with that favorite teacher that brought that project to you, you could do it instantaneously. We want people to work on things they're passionate about. We know that people will work longer and harder and persist in the face of obstacles if they work on things they care about deeply and then play. And when I say play, I don't just mean playing games. I mean a type of attitudes towards, towards your interactions. When someone is playful in their interactions, that they're doing things where they take risks, they test the boundaries, they try new things, they continually experiment. And that's the best way to develop as a creative thinker, by projects, peers, passion and play. So like I said, all this really is tied into that messy minds idea. You know, creative people aren't characterized by their um, consistency. Um, they're characterized by their variability. They're characterized by their, trial, their, their ability and willingness to have lots of trial and error, their ability to um, not be hindered by what is, okay? Because we often reward people in, in the world who um, do what people ask them to do or, or, you know, like, good job, you got an A, you learned that, that paper. But creative people aren't characterized by that. They're characterized by the ability to inhibit the pressure to conform and to go beyond to what could be. On the intersection of games, which is something that I'm passionate about, I enjoy, it's a lot of fun. And then my cause, which is helping uh, diversify or, or bring awareness about diverse groups of people in the schools and in education. And my passion is about student voice because I believe with every ounce of my being that students have something to teach us. One of the mantras of our institute here is that not only does every student have something to teach us, but that students are the potential, they're not the problem. And But when I went to the middle school, I was shocked at the amount of silence in the room. Of course the kids were very talkative in the hallway, but it was like as soon as the bell stopped or the music stopped, they just stared at you. And so I started having really rich conversations with my students about, you know, why aren't you asking questions? Why aren't you interested? And they said, Mrs. Klein, you're the only one that really wants us to talk. You're just supposed to give us the information. And, you know, I really thought long and hard about that. And I said, no, like, you guys are the ones who are supposed to fuel this conversation and, you know, ignite these conversations and discussion. And so we really started to think deeply about our practice together and creating and developing lessons. So really just giving the classroom back to the students. And when I became a mom, you know, I realized that every single student in my classroom truly was someone else's entire world. And that's absolutely what's been proven to me because, of course, the kids who are gamers were, like, thrilled. And they were, like, gung-ho and re really ready to rock. But the kids who were used to playing school I mean, had it figured out. They knew just how to do it and how to get what they needed, that A on the report card. They were a little unsettled with this whole game. We're, what are we doing? We're not, where's my worksheets? We're, hold on a second, where's my textbook? So it really was a leap of faith for a lot of them. It started with um, Pigston University, where we weren't learning anything, but we had a pet pig, and they were learning all these tricks, which were imaginary. We just thought it was fun. And then we decided to make an actual like institute for real Minecraft players so they could learn about it. And I was taking a lot of classes and I finally graduated, I think first in magic and first in education. And then like educating other students. So I became a teacher at the Minecraft Institute of Technology. We've even started a weekly um, 
web show every Tuesday at 3.30 in the afternoon. We broadcast and we have people tune in to all over the country and even all over the world. We had a person from New Zealand last week, we had some from Australia, California, and it's so cool to see all these teachers coming in and using these Tech Sherpas and getting the ideas and spreading the program across the country, just helping kids grow and helping teachers grow. Recently, I had the honor of helping create course curriculum, a programming class for a middle school where, uh, down where I go to school in Waco, uh, Waco ISD there. And what was so unique about this class and the way we structured it was that we built it in a way where the students could outpace the class. Well, what do I mean by that? The teachers hadn't taken programming before. They, were, uh, they knew about it, they understood it, um, but it was clear that the students, their generation, understand the technology better and would outpace the class. And what was unique was that the school in that class supported that type of learning. Learning outside the bounds of the curriculum, outside of the bounds of the class. And the interesting thing is, poetry wasn't something that I was always into. For as long as I can remember, I was always an avid prose reader. I would read lots of novels, write my own short stories. And it wasn't until a couple weeks before my freshman year that one morning I woke up and spontaneously decided to write a poem. It was completely out of the blue. But from there, I began to read more poetry online, and I began to take more experience. I began to experiment more with my own writing. I've learned a lot of really important lessons. The first of which is that through the internet, really anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your ideas valued. I was just some random 13-year-old kid who didn't know what a pancreas was. It doesn't matter what your age is, gender is, or where you come from. It's just your ideas that count. And so think, if a 13-year-old who didn't know what pancreas was could find a new way to attack pancreatic cancer, just imagine what you could do. And I went home frustrated. I went home and asked the question, why? And could there be a better way of learning? So that's when I created a YouTube video showing how one-to-one -one mobile learning would transform the way we educate our youth. That video went viral all over the world, and that's when I decided to go to college and form the iSchool Initiative. Now, at our core, first and foremost, we are here to empower students to have a voice in education. How often do we stop ourselves and ask our students what they want to see happen in the classroom?